What's going on y'all? Jason here. We are going to continue our series of mailbox locks by going over the Compex C9100 and C9200 styles of mailbox locks. These are more commonly known as the USPS L1172C locks because they have that stamped in the face. We're going to talk about these from the locksmith side, about why they're stamped that, how they're different from the old style locks, the keys involved, how they're put together, all that other fun locksmith stuff. We've sold tons of these ever since they came out in about 2005. So let's get started with the C9100 and C9200 mailbox locks from Compex. Alrighty y'all, before we get started, as with any mailbox lock video that we do, I will mention that post office box locks are controlled and underneath the United States government, United States Postal Service. You cannot reproduce keys that say USPS do not duplicate. You cannot work on any box in a federal USPS facility and you if you are renting or leasing a space you as the tenant still do not own that property if you need a mailbox lock if you need keys to your mailbox locks you need to get with your landlord do not tamper with or mess with or try to order and do this yourself if you are leasing again it is not your box you do have to go through your management company who can assist you with getting a new lock on that lock if you are a management company we will put a link up to our website here we do sell these so feel free to go to our website and order as many as you need we sell these by the hundreds every month so just a note do not try to pick or drill or do anything to one of your locks even though it is not on a usps facility if you are renting or leasing you do have to get with the management company to do anything to your mailbox lock there are stiff fines and possible jail sentences involved if you're not authorized to do anything to that mailbox lock. So let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and flash up a few pictures here so that we can talk about it in detail. The first one here is a common business standalone pedestal mailbox unit. You can see this one has a A through H and then a J and then 11 and 12. Looks like they were misnumbered there. One bigger box. Usually that's a trap box where the key, when you put it in, they will put the key to that box in your box. You open your box, there's a key there. You put the key in the bigger box on the bottom right, open it up, and it has uh, the key in there. That's a trap system. The key will be trapped in there. I see a lot of broken keys because of that, but if you see a key sticking out of the box, that means the key is trapped in there and won't release until it is toggled by uh, the post office who puts the key back in there. Now on these boxes and all like apartment style cluster boxes, there is one key that opens the whole unit. That is the key that is strictly controlled by USPS. So you cannot have keys for those locks. You can order locks that open those whole units. If you own the unit and in some way have control over that, that just varies by jurisdiction. You'd have to be a private owner. And it wouldn't have you wouldn't be able to have that key even if you're a business owner you cannot have the key that opens all the boxes like that that is strictly controlled by usps you if you change it you would be locking out the delivery person so you cannot tamper with that unless you have one of these boxes that you're using for like a filing cabinet that's the only way you can put in a new lock there otherwise it would fall back on those usps rules now our next picture, these came out in about 2005, 2006. And we can see from this picture that the USPS L1172 is again a specification. That does not mean that's what that lock is. That did not, does not mean this is USPS owned. That simply means USPS 
1172, that means this lock meets that specification. And basically that specification says that it must resist a thousand pounds of pulling or pressure force. If somebody was trying to pry this open, it means this cam right here and the lock itself is designed to resist up to a thousand pounds of force. And we can see this is a big beefy cam. This cam does not come with either one of these locks. It is a sold separate item. So if you are the management company, when you take this off, do not discard that cam. The older locks used smaller cams and had less resistance to bending and popping open. That was one of the biggest differences in the change. However, we can see once we take this one off in just a second, this has the old double D cutout. And you can see the new locks have kind of a half double D. And what happens is this Bible is trapped in that cutout right there and it helps resist a twist attack by somebody using a pair of pliers or something to try to twist it open having that new notch style will resist the force of that pressure the old locks even though it looks very similar were not really meant you can use the new locks in the old cutouts the old regular double d cutout However, you cannot use old locks in the new boxes. The new boxes were called 4C, the letter C, 4C. The old boxes were 4B and probably 4A and some other ones before that. So you can use the new locks in the old cabinets, but you cannot use the old locks in the new cabinets. You have to make, uh, you have to put the USPS, the 9100, 9200 in there. So if we look at the next image, it tells us the differences in the two. So uh, the, uh, it's supposed to have a stainless steel plug. It does not look stainless steel to me, but uh, there are stainless steel pins in there. It has a 12 degree extra taper on the head. That is to resist somebody putting a pair of pliers on there and twisting it off. The new locks, as you can see, if we set them side by side here, let's zoom in a little bit more. We can see that the new locks have a little bit more of a taper on the head, which would really make it so that you are, it's way less resistant to a pair of pliers grabbing onto it. So that taper helps that, similar to a security collar for a mortise cylinder on the door. Uh, the 3 16 cam has the bigger cam. And uh, the other minor one is the drain holes that are in the bottom. Here we see two little holes on the old one it did not have the holes presumably there's a lot of problems with water pulling up in there so when water seeps into the face of it here which this is just a dust cover like you would see on an automotive you know like on a car lock but those two drain holes keep the moisture from building up in there and uh, our last picture here we have uh, they say two key ways with a thousand changes each one of the keyways is 4300 and the other is 4301. The ILCO numbers are not that one. Or the ILCO numbers are, I don't have one out here, 1646 and 1646R. They are just the reverse of each other. It varies, does not matter. The codes could be one or the other. You could have a 1646 here and in the very next lock, it could be a 1646R. It strictly goes by code numbers. The old code numbers ended with PO. So you'd have four numbers and then PO. The new numbers end with PS. And the series goes 1000 through 19, 1999 and 3000 through 3999 3, is the 4300 or the 1646. So we see this one is 3669 PS. So that would fall under the 4300 or the 1646 key. And we can hold it up here and see that is the right key. The old locks use the NA14. A lot of questions are about this bottom notch. This bottom notch is not really that significant nowadays. Back a while ago it used to be, but now there I don't think really that notch does a whole lot. Uh, really at all so uh, yes that's it let's go ahead and start taking this apart we're getting a little bit longer in this video than I wanted to be 
but once you get it open either you pick it or you drill it however you get it open of course you're going to need a new one once the door is open if you're the management company if you go when the usps person is there and she opens the door let's it's in the locked position here and uh, simply the easiest way to do this is just unscrew this nut you can do that with a pair of pliers you can do that with a half inch crescent wrench and once you take the nut off you are done let the usps person be on their way because once this cam is off you can just open the door as needed and deal with it later and hold on to this cam because it is sold separately none of these locks come with that cam you have to purchase it separately so definitely hold on to that and uh, then with a pair of pliers you would simply grab the clip and pull it off and your lock will drop off like so so that's all there is to switching it out you take your new one put it back in in reverse and you're done new ones come with three keys again check our website if you need to order these however at this point and um, the locksmith side if for some reason you came up to this lock you did not have another one keys can be made for these by the spacing and depth and by taking it apart however when we sell these locks we include this handy little warning we'll zoom in on that and it says do not attempt to remove the key from the lock until cam is tightened down on the back and do not tighten the nut down too hard that we've been attaching to every box that we sell but you can see at some point they figured that out and decided to put the warning in on their own bag so if you were on site and you had opened this you you could make keys for it it is just as easy to go ahead and switch it out the new locks again come with three keys typically two to give to the tenant one for the management company to keep however they are held together with uh, as i mentioned before there is a pin and a spring that is pushed down in a slot in the back of that so even if you had the keys or even if you picked it you could not take the core out because that pin is pushed down into that slot the only way to get it out is to literally pry this cover up right here which you can do with a sharp instrument take it apart uh, either by shimming it or you had already picked it and uh, making the keys by kind of decoding how tall the pins are again all that takes quite a bit of time when it's just as easy to replace it if you really want to use this in the future you could always bring it back make keys for it and then move it along also it's a good security thing to do because most of the time of course you're going to have lost keys you don't know who had the keys or who lost the keys or where the keys were lost so when you're on site it is best to simply replace it with a different key now you can if you decide to take it apart it would be best to move the pins around before we make the key and uh, we're going to go ahead and do this so basically this is just a ground down screwdriver or i call it my stabby screwdriver and you know i don't really do this a whole lot so forgive me but we are going to maybe have to put this in a vise i don't know yet let's take a look and see if we can just get that back cover to pop off there we go at least we can take it apart for the video so got it bent up just a bit let's see and i'm gonna go ahead and drop that pin out not lose it you don't want to lose the pin for sure there's our spring and there's our well that's a spring from the other chamber but we have that pin kind of out of the way there we go we can see it is just a flat pin on both sides i don't know how zoomed in i am there there we go and uh, we do know that this was the last pin as well it looks like uh, stainless steel so now we've got that out of the way if we had the key the core would just simply come out however we don't have the key but we do have a shim here i'm not going to really take the time to try to pick it but we can just shim it as regular now because 
what was blocking us was that pin beforehand and now that it is out of the way we're good to go with just shimming it so we're about three this is number two and there we go now this is a small diameter and uh, I'm not quite prepared let's see if this smallest diameter fits it yep does not quite go over that part. okay um, it's a little bit smaller so what I'm going to do is go ahead and put this shim back in just so that the top springs don't do anything else now there we go and we can see let's see how close we can zoom Say one, two, three, four, five chamber holes, and then uh, if we looked in here, there's actually six chamber holes. And let's put this pin back in. Little bitty tiny pins you don't want to lose. These pins they don't really make rekeying kits for these, so about the only thing you can do if you wanted to rekey one of these would be to take this pin and switch them around which would be the best way to do it before you made a key but if we look at that just looking at that bidding it looks to me like this would be four and then uh, three two two three looks like four three two two three yep so we wanted to rekey it we could take this four we could take this whatever that was put that there put that four at the end and we have uh i guess that would be three three two two four three three two two four so we would come back to our area here and we're gonna go try cutting it for three now wait three three what did i say three three two two four and we can go try to cut that and see what happens so we'll move this over real quick we're gonna finish up this video fairly shortly so i'll be right back all right, guys, so before we get started cutting this, because I'm not real hip, I don't often, like I mentioned before, we usually just switch them out. I often don't do this part. So I may have read that code wrong. I'm probably going to cut a little bit shallower. I'm thinking it was 33224, but I'm actually going to cut it one depth deeper. I'm actually going to cut this first one, check it to see how far off of a guess I have there. But uh, 22113 or 33224 was my guesses. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and get the right blank and talk a little bit louder because I'm going to cut this machine on, but I'm going to reduce the volume. So I'm going to start off at 150 on the micrometer card. And these are laser cut to help the key go in and out and reduce wear. You can laser cut on the 1200 we're going to actually do that so we're going to start off with two at 150 two is 211 so we're going to cut 211 and actually pull it off and check it real quick uh, yep i think we are too i don't know that looks high but there is a little bit of a tolerance there so we're actually going to go with the 22113 and check it in the lock and see what happens. So I'm going to go back to 150 because I'm laser cutting this. 211, it was 22, so we're going to go back to 211. I'm going to hold that at 211 and I'm going to move it to 255 right there. 
Now our next one is shallower, so we need to go ahead and pull the depth off and put it on 229 for one. So 220, 230, 229. We're still at spot two, but we're gonna move it to three and four at 229. So I'm gonna hold this here and go all the way to 465. At 50, 460, 465. The next cut is deeper, so I can keep going all the way to the fifth space, which is 570. And then cut down to my third depth, yeah, which is 193. 193 ish. All right, so that gives us a laser cut key, and we'll check it. And we can see that last pin is actually deeper. So that last pin is not a three, it's actually a four. So I was only, I was only right with one on that first guess. I'm gonna pull the key out, go back, make that a little bit deeper. Now you can clip these out with a Lishy Clipper. I would do that if I had to in the field. Let's say I came up on one of these and for some reason I didn't have a replacement lock with me. I would do this if I did not have to drill out the lock. So 175 is our four depth. And we're going to go down to 175. And so now we have 22114. Yep, that looks like it's it. All right, got it back over to the bench and we're going to follow this back through. And while we have it out, we're gonna go ahead and take a look. We see that notch, that notch right there is what this pin was dropping and pressing into. So everything looks good. We're gonna follow it back through, pull our shim out and snap it together. Now remember we are missing our top pin and our top spring here. We need to get a pair of tweezers and get these fellas back in there in addition to the pin that holds it together. Okay, and then our pin that has no spring but it is exactly the same height so basically it's not spring loaded it is just the exact same height now when you're bending this back down you have to uh, since we lost since that spring since we bent it a little bit too much when you're bending this back you're going to want to make sure that spring does not go in at an angle again i'm not sure if you can see it or not but the spring is trying to not really sink down correctly. So I'm going to use just the end of a pick here and push it back straight. And squeeze down a bit more. Okay. And push it back straight one more time. And then finish with squeezing this together. Now you want to make sure that you get this together pretty well. You don't want it coming apart when the customer is using it. And I will typically take a pair of pliers, squeeze it down like that, and then I'll come in along the top of the Bible and just squeeze and scratch them together. And what that did was it folded the metal over when I squeezed, scratched it. I call that squeeze scratch. <laughs> squeeze scratching is kind of pulling the pulling the metal over to hold that cap in real well. And once that's done, we check our key. Works smooth. Remember, it's not held on yet. So when you pull the key out, don't try to yank it out without doing your thumb or a finger in front of it there. And once you're done, you basically just put it back in your cabinet. Slip your clip on make sure it is fully secured there are two different 
thicknesses, uh, two different slots that you can put this in. Some of these cabinets have a double layer, so you may need to use that other slot. And pull your key out carefully. Put your cam on like it was supposed to, like it was prior to. And put your nut on. And again, as the directions on the package says, do not over tighten this nut. It is not. It'd be very similar in the locksmith world as tightening down the screw cap too tight on the back of a cylinder. That would be pretty much the same thing. It won't work. It causes the key to bind up. So if we tighten it down, so we cranked it down there. We go to put our key in and like I can't turn it very easily. So it's sometimes the key won't even go in. So we're going to back it off just a bit and then tighten it down just a bit and you notice i didn't tighten it down as hard still kind of hard to turn the key so you don't want to break your key off for sure so we're going to back that off just a bit more don't do this with the key in it by the way it's a bad idea so all right and it is a good idea to use Loctite if you so inclined or if for some reason that keeps getting loose. But these from the factory, these kind of are don't really need Loctite really because they are, I guess, just off just enough so that when you're tightening it down, it's, it's kind of like a lock nut. It stays where it's supposed to be. But if you're having problems with it being too loose, you can always put Loctite on there. And before you close and lock your cabinet, you want to check your key by opening and closing it a few times and pulling the key out, putting the key in, making sure it is good and like it's supposed to be before you actually leave it. So that is it. Again, thanks for watching, guys. If you're new to the channel, make sure and hit that like and subscribe and notification button. And we will be talking about other mailbox locks the next one up. Actually, I've done the video on this one already, but I have not released it. We're going to talk about Salisbury. And then we're going to go over some of the older styles of locks that these also have replaced. As always, if you have any questions or comments, we'll leave them in the comments section. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll catch you all next video.